as adults of the species, right? our attitude towards the children of the species is we know what we have to teach you, we know how to teach you, and we're going to teach you according to what we think is really important for you to learn. And that is so colors everything about how we think and how we educate, rather than having a somewhat different perspective that says, our primary mission is to care for how well you learn your way into the world. How will you learn your way into becoming who you're going to become? How will you learn your way into facility with the things we insist you have good facility with, like reading and math, etc.? And that, that misorientation, that orientation that's coming from this adult, arrogant, presumptuous attitude that we know what you need. We know that in order for you to think what we think, believe what we believe, know what we know, be able to do what we're able to do, these are the things that we've got to take you through. And we treat them for the most part. I'm not trying to say that there isn't compassion and heart and all of that. There is, certainly. I'm saying that, that, unfortunately, it's misoriented. That our fundamental assumption about education is one of, the, in fact, the entire argument in education is an argument over which way to format them. And that the shift needs to become, how do we start to become agents, stewards, right? You understand the word steward? It means there's no other agenda in play. Kind of weightlessly there, with the, your mission being to steward how healthily they learn their way in. Which is entirely different than having this uh, attitude of trying to format them, trying to mold them, trying to shape them, trying to teach them particular things. As if is there anything in particular that you've ever learned that's more important than your ability to learn? Anybody? And yet the entire education system kind of proceeds from that. So in order to have this next conversation, and this is going to connect up, we'll kind of come to a close that recycles back to the code conversation and the learning to read conversation. And now I want to go into the conversation about learning. So what is learning? Are you ready? I know some of you have some ideas about this. Acquiring knowledge. Okay. Application and synthesis. Application and synthesis. Okay. Anybody else? Structuring. Structuring, restructuring, okay. Engagement, okay. Without fear, without fear, okay. All right. So I appreciate all these distinctions. They're helpful. <clears throat> and I, I, I want to be careful here. I mean, no offense. And as I said early on, there's no blame, right? This is, there's nothing, there's nobody that's wrong about any of this. Right? We're, 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 this is just the trajectory of the unfoldment of history at this particular snapshot in time about how we think. But generally, what we heard today is what's commonly understood. Learning is typically thought of as the process through which we acquire knowledge, skills, and experience. Yeah? And what I want to do right now is to say that's a really limiting view of what learning is. It's an incredibly limiting view. It's a misorienting view. It, it's not helpful to us thinking about the challenges involved in learning. Right? It's not helpful to us in terms of for, you know, understanding what we can do to really make things different for the lives and trajectories of our children. Learning is the, in my language, learning is the central dynamic of being human. It's not just about acquisition. It's not just an ancillary utility. Like we're, here we are, 
And then learning is this kind of side thing we do to acquire knowledge and skills. Learning is how we become who we become in every dimension. And it's not just about each of us here today. It's about how we got here today. The difference, if you were to, to uh, peer inside the brain of a Stone Age person and compare that with the brain of a modern lab scientist, you would not find a massive difference. You wouldn't find any real difference in the neurobiology or genetics of their brain. The entire difference between those two brains is a learned difference. A learned difference. The same is true. I mean, if we were to look at what's going on in a, you know, an kind of Aboriginal tribe or a modern, you know, political rally, the difference is not a difference in genes or neurobiology. It's a difference in learning. If we were to look at the difference between the warfare of thousands of years ago and today at a technical level or at a psychological, social level. The differences are learning. If we're to look at the difference in early modern, early modern science and current science, errors included, <laughs> right? The difference is a difference in learning. If we're to look at the difference between the first appearance of laws, the Hanarabic Code, right? And the modern idea of law, the difference is not a difference in our biology, it's a difference in our learning. Across the world, people with equal intelligence, equally complex language, can be living in radically different cultures with radically different kinds of technologies. Um, those that can look as the Stone Age of millions, a million years ago, those that can look uh, as modern as we are today sitting uh, in this studio. Um, the same brains can be producing all of those systems, in part because it's not all inside the head. Changes in the human lifestyle for the last 50,000 years have had very little to do with any biological change in our brains. The reason that we live differently today from the way the, the cavemen lived is not because we have better brains, but because we've been accumulating all of the thousands of discoveries that our ancestors have made. We have the benefit of a huge history of inventions that we communicate non-genetically through language, through documents, through customs. So, as helpful as these uh, giants of uh, Western thought have been, they've been misleading in a certain way. Right? It's not, not only do I think, therefore I am, how I think is learned. I am who I learn to be. Not only is knowledge power, what's the real power of knowledge? The real power of knowledge is how well it resources our ongoing learning, because knowledge is always terminal. Knowledge, knowledge is always fixed, approximate, to a particular context or situation, and learning is universally relevant. Learning is the golden goose, and knowledge is the golden egg. Right? We keep trying to perfect the egg and ignore the goose. So, for many, many years, my... Um, one of my primary concerns has been to flip the paradigm and say that rather than thinking of uh, learning as the uh, utility for the acquisition of knowledge and experience, I'm going to think of knowledge and experience as the exercise environment for extending learning. And that one flip changes the way we think about what we're doing in education. There's no dimension of ourselves. I mean, what part of, let's have a little conversation. Is there any part of yourself that isn't learned or profoundly shaped by learning?
any part of your physical health, emotional patterns, the way that you kind of react or relate, you know, your capacity for connection and dialogue and sharing with others. Anybody? I mean, certainly we could say that, you know, my bones or my original structure, certain aspects of my original structure are kind of genetically extruded or genetically propelled, right? But even the genes we're realizing, they kind of differentially unfold according to what's happening as they adapt to the environment. And what is adapt to the environment another word for? Learning. Just like evolution is another word for learning. So whether we talk about the, uh, our emotional life, our physical life, I mean, <clears throat> clearly some children um, are uh, suffering physical health developmental uh, consequences, things ranging from coordination issues, right, to how they relate to their bodies, to how um, active they are, right, the sports that they'll engage with or not engage in, right, how um, vital and strong their energy is. The, these aren't necessarily predicted from their genes. These are consequences of how they've learned to inhabit themselves based on the learning environment. The entire, everything that's happening to a child, in my view, needs to be looked at as if it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of the learning environment in which they're learning to become themselves. Everything from the food they eat to the interactions they have, to the language they're hearing, to the way their mother and father and sisters and siblings and friends are emotionally relating to them, to how their minds are being challenged, what's happening in school. I mean, what aspect of our life isn't sh fundamentally shaped by learning? This is not only true from the very get-go, with respect to our early learning experience. And then we'll play this again. Our emotional patterns, how we learn to regulate ourselves emotionally. We do that. I mean, we, one of the biggest problems with the psychologist, we've talked to the psychologist that we'll, we'll talk about in terms of the great confusion, one of the greatest confusions we have, is that we tend to, to think that others cause our emotions. Right? Well, you did this, you made me angry, you made me sad, you made me feel this, you made me feel that. Right? Whereas, <clears throat> as we get, as, if you actually travel into it from the kind of neuroscience and psychology, it becomes really clear our emotions are kind of a dashboard, a feedback system. They're more reflective of how we're processing experience than what we're experiencing. Right? They're learned ways they're, they're the consequence of how we learn to process what's happening to us. Our emotions weren't given. They're how we uh, emote, how we relate, what we feel at any given time has a genetic biological component to it, a neurobiological component to it. Um, it's, it's connected to what's called affect, affects, which are kind of the uh, neurobiological precursors of emotions. But think of those things like the colors in a painter's palette, the painting, which is the feeling, the emotion that we're actually experiencing, is something that our nervous systems have kind of learned to make out of our core emotional um, affect system in relation to the environment and to what we're experiencing. In other words, again, the emotions that we feel are a consequence of how we learn to process emotions. We're going to come back to this. This is really important because the biggest thing that enables learning is emotion. The biggest thing that disables learning is emotion. So we have to understand the relationship between emotion and learning if we're going to start caring about learning. Uh, how many of you have seen the marshmallow test? So the ones that were here Thursday night, I know did. I think it's worth playing for the others, yeah? Okay. I hear from, I have a very important message. I think we have a problem. 
the most important factor for success. And it was found close to here, Stanford. A college professor took kids that were four years old and put them in a room all by themselves. And he would tell the child, four-year-old kid, Johnny, I'm going to leave you here with a marshmallow for 15 minutes. If after I come back, this marshmallow is here, you will get another one. So you will have two. To tell a four-year-old kid to wait 15 minutes for something that they like, it's equivalent to tell us, we'll bring you coffee in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened when the professor left the room? PBS special that was on a couple of years ago. Neuroplasticity is the key to brain fitness. The brain is malleable. Throughout our entire lives, it can be physically and functionally changed, even improved upon by how we use it. Brain plasticity has been called one of the most extraordinary discoveries of the 20th century. It's true throughout evolution that the plasticity of the brain, the ability of the brain to adapt to our environment, continues through life. That adaption is an opportunity for us to continue to stimulate our brain and slow down the degenerative progression during aging. Slow down the degenerative progression during aging. So, from birth, 
I mean, one of the most amazing things that uh, has come out recently has to do with uh, infants and how infants learn. Have you seen the uh, scientist in the crib who read that, anybody? I highly recommend that. Right? Or, um, <clears throat> little babies, we found that we could stick pacifiers in their mouth. Within two weeks, if the pacifier has, has got correlated behavior with the room that they're in, like making the lights come on or the music go up and down, little babies, newborns, will learn to control the room around them with the pacifier. We are born learning oriented, right? massively learning oriented, like nothing else in the universe, and no other form of being that we're aware of in the universe. We are born to learn our way in to being as present and as capable as is possible in the environments in which we're living. At every level, one of the most amazing uh, studies to come out recently had to do with how. Um, <clears throat> The baby's cry is affected, is an adapted response to the language that's going around the mother's womb. In other words, even when they're in the womb, muddled by all that, they're already they're paying attention to the outer world and it's already starting to shape how they come in. We're massively learning on it. This is not only true for us as individuals from birth, before birth, to at least death, right? Uh, in, in every dimension of our being, um, <clears throat> it's true for us collectively. So again, what, what I'm pointing to is, is that we, t we tend to think, I learn, right? We say that, so I learned this, I learned that, I learned that. One of the things I think we need to start to do is say, I am learned. Who I am is learned. Who we are is learned. We've learned our way to be here. We've learned our way to have the psychological patterns, the intellectual patterns, the knowledge, the there's just no aspect of ourselves that isn't a consequence of this. And this is not only true for us individually, like I said, this is true for us collectively. No matter what problem that you want to address, whether it's the ecology or the environment or the uh, learning disabled political system that we're in, right? whatever aspect of our collective uh, being, of our collective being together, you want to talk about the problem that we're having is a learning related problem. That our competitive advantage, workforce development, doesn't matter. I mean, we talk to Nobel Prize economists. But the technology of human skill formation. And it is that skill begets skill, that knowledge begets knowledge, and that we have a dynamic process. It's a growth trajectory. You can start off early and accelerate. You can start off early and just go off the rails. And so it's a dynamic process. Human beings are not fixed creatures. They can change. They do change. They develop. If somebody gets far off the developmental process, they're going to be at a major disadvantage. May never be able to catch up. It'll be very costly to get them to catch up. And it's costly the later you go in trying to remediate the disadvantage. On the other hand, you start with a guy, a girl, whoever, and who gets a very good advantage. And this feeds back a sense of self confidence, a sense of command, control, and adventure. So you go out and you learn more. And you get what economists call increasing returns. You just, you know, the more input, the more output, but not just one for one, but maybe one for two. So there really are dynamic features to these models where you actually inputs, more inputs, create even more, uh, greater outputs. So whether you talk about um, that what's dragging down our economy or what's making it vibrant, right? What's the drive of innovation? Everything translates back to learning. Cost of our healthcare, the cost of social pathology, the cost of poverty. Let's talk about health care a moment. We have this big, massive conversation about Obamacare, right? And, and the two plus two and a half trillion dollars is estimated that this country spends on health care related things. Leading the way on all of the health expenses, some 85 to 90 percent of all health care related costs are a consequence of learned behaviors. Yeah. 
right? From 90% of heart risk failure, 82% of cancers, just in the literacy field. It's something like 40% of, of hospitalizations are unnecessary and, and tend to be with low literacy people that uh, really could have been prevented with, with better information um, or higher literacy. It's a direct relationship between people who have low literacy skills and people who have unhealthy um, uh, habits. Yeah. What are the chances of a kid getting AIDS? I feel about What are the chances of a, what was the difference in chances of a child with low literacy getting AIDS? Or, well, it's actually much higher. Does anybody think that there's much higher because they, they can't read? Because they couldn't read about AIDS? No. It's because the collateral consequences of the process of learning to read damaged them more generally and made them more susceptible to all kinds of problems. It's the collateral effect of learning difficulties that creates such harm in us. Sustainable business. Why is it so important for companies to be like Now, there's a telling quotation from a man named Ray State. State was for many years CEO of analog devices, a semiconductor company. And he said, the rate at which organizations and individuals learn may well become the only sustainable competitive advantage. Products can be copied, services can be copied, even processes can be copied. Things like Six Sigma, available on the open market. But if you're learning more rapidly than the competition, you can get ahead and stay ahead. Not only that, the world is changing. We have a more global environment. Industry boundaries are collapsing. Previously regulated businesses are becoming deregulated. We've got new business models. If your rate of learning isn't greater than that rate of change, you're going to fall behind. So it doesn't matter which guru, these are the kind of league of gurus of business management theory over the past 40 or 50 years. The essence of what every one of them has been saying in one form or another is how well your organization does, how well it competes, how well it develops the right products for the right markets, how well you know, your employee workforce is happy and content and, and uh, adapting to what the business needs. It all breaks down. It all is connected to learning. All recognize these companies? Right? You know what makes them all different than any companies that ever existed before? They're learning oriented in the way they relate to their customers. How many people buy things at Amazon? Okay. And how many of you, before you buy something from Amazon, it's one thing if it's a commodity or a product you're already familiar with, but if it's something you're not familiar with, before you push the buy button, how many of you look at the feedback from other people that bought it? Okay, all right, so what's the feedback doing? What's the system doing? It's mediating a learning-oriented relationship between the people that have been involved with buying that product or service or whatever that is, and the people that are contemplating buying it, so you can learn your way into whether or not it's the right decision for you. And it's the same thing, right? Um, the uh, Netflix ratings, right? Or uh, the whole eBay was nothing but basically a swap meet, you know, flea market, uh, online flea market that you could uh, trust who you're dealing with based on feedback, right? Based on this kind of learning oriented relationship. This, Angie's list is all about that, right? All of these kind of emerging companies right now, what they realized is the best way that they can serve you and therefore retain you as a customer is to provide you with a super robust learning environment so that you can feel empowered to learn your way into making the right decision. So again, the, it's at the core of technology, it's at the core of business, it's at the core of the healthcare, it's at the core of the, of the economy as a whole. In every respect. This is a 
not new, one of the most amazing things to me, kind of studying this, is I've been on about this for quite a while. Things that interest me is that people have always recognized this. One of, the most, one of my most favorite statements is this one by Cesare de Sesto on Da Vinci, one of uh, da Vinci's kind of main students. And he said, well, wasn't, it wasn't this guy's art, artistic qualities, right? It wasn't all of the mastery that we normally think about. It was his attitude about learning. And in quoting him, that said, the only thing that will never fail us. Very similar to, to the statement we heard about business, right? The only sustainable advantage. Right? So the gurus of business are saying, the only sustainable advantage is learning. And da Vinci is saying, the only thing that will never fail us. The, children, the world will become what our children learn it to be. I have long felt that we talk about the, the you know, various resources on our planet, the resources that are so precious to us, that there's actually, in purely financial terms, as well as social, political, and every other term, there's no more valuable resource on our planet than our children's capacity for learning. Because everything depends on it. Everything about the future is a downstream consequence of how well our children learn their way in to becoming who they're going to become. The propagation of all of our problems, our geopolitical messes, or a consequence of this recapitulating formatting of our kids in every respect. So I've, what I've hopefully I've done right now is just to take learning and expand it, right? So it's not just this utility on the side that we're using to learn about this thing or that thing. That learning is this central dynamic of being in every dimension, in every dimension of our individual and collective lives.